Okay, so this week, uh, uh, Palm Sunday kind of interrupted uh, the series that we were going through here. And uh, uh, so we're, we're up to the iron. We're almost, we're getting close to being done, right? It shouldn't, shouldn't take too much longer now. This is a lo- letter number seven from the end. So there's just six more letters to go. Um, and as you know, the reason that we're going through this uh, series is because the Hebrew Aleph Bet, excuse me, the Hebrew Aleph Bet has... Um, has a has a meaning for each letter of the alphabet and that's why Psalm 119 starts with a letter of the alphabet for each time that we go so since we've been going through what the letter means first and we've been kind of tying that to something that happened in Jesus ministry or something that happened in his life uh, and then the next week uh, we've been heading through Psalm 119 and kind of hitting that stanza, the eight verses that deal with that Hebrew letter. And so the Hebrew letter uh, has something to do with those verses, but they're not, it's not just a bunch of, it's not just a bunch of head knowledge, you know, it's not like you have to learn Hebrew in order to understand these things. It's, the idea is that each one is a step along the path. It begins us uh, from the beginning and we go all the way to the end. So this step of the path is talking about the ayin, which has something to do with insight and understanding. So in order to do that, I was going to uh, review a little bit of what the ayin is. So the ayin is the 16th letter of the Hebrew Aleph Bet. And I say Aleph Bet because that's where we get our word alphabet from, right? Um, the ayin represents the number 70, right? So it's the 16th in the sequence, and it also represents the number 70. And it's also the 7th from the end, which is kind of interesting. I don't... God knew what he was doing when he put, the, when he put this together. It's not like our alphabet, which just seems to be like random letters, uh, kind of generally in the place where the Hebrew al. al- alphabet was. Um, so the ayin represents the number 70 and an ayin is an I. Can you hear the word I and ayin? There's an I and I. Okay, sorry. Anyway, so the word ayin is an I. And so in ancient pictographs it would be like a circle with a dot in it, right? And some people think that's where we got our letter O because O is like a circle and it's a vowel. The ayin represents insight. Now when we talked about this, a lot of times when you go through the New Testament, this is, the, this is just a little bit of review in case you weren't here or in case you were, uh, as far as what we talked about. When Jesus said, if the eye of your bo- if body is good, then he gives light to the whole body. And what does that all mean? Well, it means it's talking about generosity. Because that's in a whole list of verses talking about generosity versus being selfish, right? And so um, that's what this, the iron is generous, it's good, or it's selfish, and it sees something and it wants it, it wants to consume. And so if your eye is good, it means that you're generous, and the light that gives light to your whole body is, is good. But if, the, if your eye is evil, right, or you're selfish, and that's the light for your body because it comes in through your eyes and that's what gives light to what you see, then your whole, then how great is that darkness, right? So that's what Jesus is talking about. It's a whole picture of this form of the eye. Now, you might not have heard that before, and that's because a lot of people don't look at the Hebrew alphabet and connect it with that. But if you understand what those letters mean, you're going to see it all throughout Jesus' ministry. And it's really kind of an amazing thing. So we're going to be heading through Psalm 119, 121 through 128, uh, which is the heading. If you have a Bible, you will see uh, in this Bible right here, it has it in English and it says ayin, right? And then the next is pe. It looks like pe with a P-E or P-E, physical, no, anyway. It's a pe and then a, a tzad and a kof. And you'll see that in your Bible. In the Old King James Bible, they actually have a Hebrew character in there. So uh, it's actually pretty interesting. So this is what it looks like. And the reason I put this up there is to show you how that works. See, this eight verses, they all begin with that same letter, ayin. So we're going to read that real quick, but I'm going to do it in English, right? I have what is just, I have done what is just and right. Do not leave me to my oppressors. Give your servant a pledge of good. Let not the insolent oppress me. My eyes long for your salvation and for the fulfillment of your righteous promise. Deal with your servant according to your steadfast love and teach me your statutes. I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. It is time for the Lord to act for your law has been broken. Therefore, I love your commandments above gold, above fine gold. Therefore, I consider all your precepts to be right and I hate every false way. And so that's uh, what the Hebrew says translated in English in the English Standard Version. So each line, line as we see begins with an ayin. The concept of the ayin is implied. 
throughout the whole stanza. So when you're thinking about this, it's supposed to be a little bit of a game in your mind. You think, what does the ayin mean and how does it apply in this part of scripture? And so how does the ayin relate to this stanza? Those are the, those are the uh, three, uh, two questions and actually or two statements and a question that we've actually been looking at every time we go through this. And so we're just going to, to hit right in. There's a lot of good lessons. And as we go through here, I'm going to put this at the beginning, even though it's not in your notes. And we're actually going to kind of recap it here in the summary in the end. Um, but as you go through this, there are eight lines. And these eight lines correspond uh, with a thought. And the first line, right, and you go, well, why does it correspond with a thought? Because each line is, you got, you've got the first eight letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and that's how you would count. And so those things are all kind of interconnected and tied together. Without getting too deep, I'll just tell you what the eight lines are kind of going to be showing us. Number one, God is first. His rules are first. He is first. He is the number one heading out of the gate. So the first line is going to have something to do with... Um, uh, God being first. The second line, uh, if God is first, that means that we are second or we are below him, which means that our ways are not his ways, which means that we go away from those ways. So there's something that needs to happen. If God is first, then we need to deal with something, and that's our sin. And so this next one is going to be, the next line is going to say something about dealing with sin. The third line, uh, the third number three or the, the gimbals where God kind of just shows up and he is exalted. And so there's going to have something to do with with God's uh, salvation or waiting for God's salvation or, or something along those lines. Uh, like last week we talked about Jesus rose on the third day, the first fruits, and so there's that kind of connection there. The fourth line will have something to do with God's instruction. And that's because the Holy Spirit comes down and gives us his instruction on how to live. The fifth line is going to have something to do with God's people being gathered to him. That's the next thing on God's prophetic timeline. We're all going to be gathered to him. The next line after that, the sixth line is going to have to do with something of judgment of the wicked. The seventh line is going to have something to do with God's kingdom. And the eighth line is going to have something to do with eternity. So if you, as we go through that, you're going to see how all that um, kind of plays. And it's kind of something you turn over in your mind and you go, oh yeah, I can see how that connects. Uh, before we get to that, there's, a very, there's an interesting thing that happens if you take just the first word of each of these lines. Uh, sometimes you look in the Bible and you think, oh, well, this is an interesting thing. But what we don't see, because we don't see the original text, is all of the little interplays that happen behind there. So this is what I'm kind of trying to show you with this, these lines. Now, you can't read that, so I'm going to put them in English. The first word is, I have made, right? Uh, the first word of the next stanza is a pledge or uh, I like the way the old English reads surety and we'll get into that word I have made a pledge my eyes make I am your servant at this time so if you put these now in English it doesn't make a nice flowing sentence in Hebrew it's a little bit easier to kind of put these together it's, uh, I have made a pledge with my eyes Make me, I am your servant at this time. Over and above, let it be so. Over and above, let it be so. So there's, these are the exact same two uh, words. That, and when it has that hyphen looking thing, that means it puts those words together. And that's why there's two words together on those. Um, and I count that as the first word. So when you put those together, there's a repetition there at the end, which makes... Let it be so, let it be so, even over and above. And lots of times, this in English is translated as therefore. Okay, so you're not going to see this uh, when I go through the rest of the verses, but uh, you'll see therefore. But in the Hebrew, it has a little bit different connotation. So, it's interesting, right? I've made a covenant with my eyes. Have you heard that verse? I've made a covenant with my eyes that I might not sin against God. Well, that, that's interesting, right? Because what leads to sin a lot of time is what comes in through your eyes. And it grabs you. First, sin is conceived. And then, uh, and then it's acted upon. And then when it's fully formed, it leads to death, right? So where does it start? A lot of times it starts with your eyes. And that's why Jesus says, if your eye causes you to sin, uh, you should pluck it out. Not that he really meant that. Uh, it was, it, he, it was uh, um, going over and above. But there's something to do with the eyes and sinning. And so if you make a covenant with your eyes, to be God's servant and that's a moment by moment decision and you confirm that over and over again that's what this step of the iron is talking about right so let's see uh, how that goes through with each of these verses 
I have done justice and righteousness. Do not leave me to my oppressors. Now you might be saying, well, that's a little bit different than the ESV. And that's because um, the ESV is a, is a good translation, but I've taken these words and I've translated them uh, in a kind of my own translation is, is basically what that is. And so uh, I go through and I go, hey, these are interesting things I'd like to point out about these words. And so then I put them together up there. So the translation that is in the Bible and that you have in your notes is going to be different than this one that comes up here. Now, it's interesting that this, this little verse right here is kind of a parallel to Psalm 9, 7 through 10. And these first two verses kind of parallel that. It says, but the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has his throne for justice and he judges the world with righteousness. Right? See, justice and righteousness. Sometimes it'll say judgment and righteousness in some versions. He judges the peoples with uprightness. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed. See, it says, do not leave me to my oppressors. A stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, I have not forsaken, or have not forsaken those who seek you. Now, this is an important passage because this verse, this passage here in Psalm 119 is saying, Do not leave me to my oppressors. Well, does God leave you to the oppressors? No. In this verse, it says, The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. It says, I have not forsaken those, or you, uh, for you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. You see, so. Um, God is not going to leave us to the oppressors. But you can see, I have done justice and righteousness. What is that? I have put God first. I have done His judge, justice. I have done His righteousness in the earth. And so, and because I've done that, I know you're not going to leave me to those who oppress what? God's judgment and righteousness. So... This is saying right here, if, you, if we want to relate it to the eye in a little bit, it says, I have done justice and righteousness. Do not leave me to my oppressors. I have insight. I have insight. I have knowledge. I have wisdom of your ways. So don't leave me under those who don't have the insight. They're not following your justice. They're not following your ways. So don't leave me under them. And God promises that he won't, right? At some point, God's kingdom comes out uh, upon the earth and those who have been doing God's will all along are elevated and those who have not, roles are reversed. The first shall become last. The last shall become first. Because what, what he's saying that when I look over all the earth, and this has been happening for thousands of years. When God looks over all the earth, the majority of people do not want to do his commandments. The majority of the people do not want to walk in his ways, right? And the ones who don't oppress the others, right? Can you see Cain and Abel happening again? Abel goes and does God's will. Cain offers his own way. And instead of Cain reforming and turning around, he kills Abel. This still happens among the world. Those who follow God's Rules and want to do his judgment and want to do uh, what his word says are out there and they're doing those things but the majority says no we don't want to do that in fact we don't like the way you do that and that you're judging me just by you existing it's a judgment against them and they go instead of turning to God go hey God forgive us we'll go your way too they kill the one who's who's doing God's work it's the same pattern going over and over again so um, says I am doing that do not leave me in that situation and we know that God will not based on Psalm, Psalm 9 uh, 7 through 10 there. Now this next verse talks about be a surety for your servant for good. Do not let the insolent oppress me. The rebellious, the insolent. Now I left this word surety in there. We don't use the word surety in modern, in modern English, but it has some, it's very good. Now if you're doing the basic Bible study, uh, when we come and come and looking at words that we don't understand, you go look them up in an English dictionary and you see why the translators use that word. So that's a little bit what I'm going to do here for you today. It says surety, a person who takes responsibility for another's performance of an undertaking. For example, they're appearing in court or the payment of a debt. So what the psalmist is asking is to be a surety for me, for good, for your servant, because I'm following your commandments. I've put you first, as in that first verse. You're not going to leave me to the oppressors, so be a surety for it. Step in my place and do something for me. Well, well what is that? Now, there's an interesting thing uh, that happens in, Saul, uh, in Genesis uh, 49, verse 3. And this is Judah here. 
And Judah is saying, I will be a pledge of his safety. Now, this is the same word uh, in Hebrew, right? And that's how you get this verse. So you find the same word, I will be a pledge. Or you could actually put, I will be a surety of his safety there. From my hand, you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. So what's he saying? He, Judah, who's talking about Benjamin, because what's going to happen is, and I'll get into that a little bit, the story of Joseph and when his brothers come to get the grain because they're starving. Uh, uh, they go down there, but they don't give his brother. And then Joseph says, you're going to bring your brother back. Go, well, I can't bring your brother. Dad's not going to let him go. No, you're going to bring your brother back because I want to see him. If I don't see your brother, I'm going to assume you're spies and, and that's it. Right? And so they go, oh, we can't go back. We can't go back. Finally, they get so hungry. Uh, Israel, who was Jacob, but is now Israel. Israel says, okay, go get them. They said, but they're going to need Benjamin, right? And so this whole thing goes. And then first of all, Reuben says, I'll, I'll step in, right? And that was before, and, Jake, and Israel didn't take him up on it. But then Judah steps in and says this. And then Jacob lets him go, which is interesting. Now, when you look at the Bible and you see these stories in the Old Testament, you go, oh, that's an interesting story. That's nice. And you read it kind of like you'd read a novel. And you go, oh, and you just put it away and, and go down. Now, think about this. How many chapters are in the Bible? How many verses are in here? Now, we can't go into everybody's life into great detail, right? So the parts of somebody's life or a story that happens in the Bible, a historical event that happens in the Bible, is put there for a reason. And it's not just so we, we have a nice story about how Judah went down with his brothers and got, brought Benjamin back uh, with him and got their father down into Egypt. I mean, it does kind of carry the arc of the story along. However, those things are in there for a reason. It's because God is showing something prophetically through them. Uh, a Hebrew idiom is that the lives of the fathers or the patriarchs are a pattern for us today. So whatever happens to them in their lives, right, is something that happens to us as well. Or something that is prophetic. It's not just for that day and time. It actually kind of echoes throughout time. And so when Judah says, I will be a pledge of his safety, I will be a, a surety for him. He says, I'm going to step in his place. If anything happens to him... I'm going to bear the blame for it. If anything happens to him, uh, you will have me to hold for account. Now that's an interesting thing. Because when Reuben said that, the oldest, uh, Israel didn't take him up on that. But when Judah says it, he does. Hmm, interesting. So Judah offers to be a surety for Benjamin because Israel does not want any harm to come to him in the land of Egypt. Now, I've left some of these words untranslated. And you're going, wait, that's all English. No, no, it, it's not English uh, because Judah is not an English word. But Judah is a Hebrew word. And Benjamin is not an English word. It's a name. But Benjamin is actually two Hebrew words put together. So let me show you what happens when you put the actual translation here. Praise, is what Judah means, offers to be a surety for son of my right hand. Because he who contends with God, that's what Israel means, does not want any harm to come to him in the land of double trouble. That's what uh, Egypt means. It's Mitzrayim. It means double straits or double narrowings, double trouble, right? Wow. Well, that's, that gives us a little bit more light on the situation. Um, but what Judas told his father is that he will die in the place of Benjamin if he cannot bring him back from Egypt. He's going to lay down his life so praise is going to lay down his life for the son of my right hand. Now here's something else if you know a little bit about um, what happened with Benjamin when he was born. Remember when Rachel had Benjamin? And uh, Benjamin was originally named Ben-Oni. Ben-Oni. As she died, her dying breath said, this is the son of my pain, the son of my agony. Right? But the father said, we're not going to saddle the boy being the son of his mother's agony, we're going to, I'm going to change it to the son of my right hand, which is a place of honor. So, so the son of agony, the son that caused so much pain, is now going to be the son of his right hand. Now there's a significance to this, because, so Judah which is praise, which is the line of the Messiah. The Messiah is going to come through there. And if you read the prophecy or the blessing that uh, Israel pronounces over Judah, it's, it's a messianic prophecy right there in Scripture. So Judah, from whom the Messiah will come, goes down to Egypt. 
Egypt is a picture of the world. If you did Passover with us, then you'll know that Egypt is a picture of the world and the Pharaoh was a picture of the God of this world. So Judah goes down to Egypt, a picture of the world, uh, with Benjamin, who is the loved one of the father, to make sure he will return to the father. So it looks like a parallel of this. Jesus, who was the son of Judah, came down to the earth to make sure the sons... That, that were such a pain and agony to God because they fell away into sin would become the sons of his right hand. They would not remain down there. So that, we were, that he came down to be with us so that we would not no longer have that stigma about us, but he would raise us up to be the son of his right hand. Now, this is, this is an interesting little thing. And it's something that I was just kind of looking through and it just kind of hit me like right between the eyes. I hope you can see how that works together um, because what happens is is in scripture you're going to see that Joseph is also a picture of the Messiah and this and that um, Egypt is a picture of the world and coming out of Egypt is a picture of coming out of slavery into being saved and so when you see these things being played out in scripture it's a hint of what's to come it's not laid out in black and white like oh yeah I can see it but it's a hint of what's to come so what I'm saying here is that there's a big hint as to what the son of the one of Judah is going to come to the earth to do so what does this have to do with this second line it has to do with the removal of sin does it not Right? Be a surety for your servant for good. Step in my place and show up for court and take the, take the, um, the judgment that was going to come upon me because I'm your servant and do it for my benefit. Right? So that's, that's an idea of removing of sin. And so what happens when, what happens when you sin? It's the insolent, the rebellious, the arrogant. They always point the finger at you, right? If you have sinned, then the insolent go, see, he's just like us. Well, the thing is, is that if you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, right? If your sin is under the blood of the cross, then you are living in freedom. But they want to point at you and say, you're sinning, therefore you're still a slave, right? And so that's how they oppress you. So that's what he's saying. He will not let the insolent oppress us. Don't let people, like, we're all trying to walk out our faith, right? And so if you're trying to walk out your faith and you're doing it with all your heart, your soul, and your might, and you, and you, you got tripped up because the enemy threw a stumbling block in your path, because that's what he does. He throws a stumbling block in your path, you fall down, he points at you, and he laughs. <laughs> See, you're not as good as you thought you were, are you? He just takes great pride and joy, and then you feel guilty, right? <sighs> all right. right? But that whole, that whole, that whole play is, is designed to be an impression because God, what God wants to do is go, hey, I know you messed up. I know you stumbled block, but hey, just repent. Say you're sorry. We'll get you right back on the road and we'll get you up and running, right? But the tool of the enemy is to say, you dirty sinner, and, and trying to motivate you by guilt. And that's the insolent oppressing us. The rebellious, those who don't want to follow God's commandments, point to you when you mess up because it makes them feel better, right? So, do not let the insolent oppress you. If you're under the blood of the Lamb, if, if God has stepped in on your behalf, and he, is, he has been a surety uh, of the servant of Him, which is you under the blood of Jesus, for your good, then don't let the insolent oppress you. And God's not going to let the insolent oppress us either. So if He's not going to do that, then why do we let it happen on our own, right? So that's uh, the idea behind the second verse. So now the third verse dealing with uh, uh, the idea of salvation. You see where salvation comes into play here. So if Jesus is the first fruits of the firstborn from the dead, then it only makes sense that it kind of shows up here in this third verse. And so it says, My eyes are worn out for your salvation and for the word of your righteousness. And this, the eyes being worn out, it means that they, in, in the King James it says, My eyes fail. For your uh, fail for salvation or for your salvation. And the idea is that you've been looking so hard for something that your sight actually fails. You're looking hard, looking hard, looking hard, and it just, you just you can't see it any longer. Um, and for the word of your righteousness. Now the idea that salvation right here and word are connected. And those two words are connected with the Messiah in, uh, throughout the Bible. And so, if you're looking for salvation, there it is right there. 
You see where I have it highlighted? That's actually the name of Jesus right there. It's Yeshua. It appears right there in the middle of the verse, right? So if you're looking for salvation, you're looking for who you're looking for. You're looking for Yeshua. And that's why God sent Yeshua to save people from their sins. He said, you will name him Yeshua, which means he saves, for he will Yasha, or save his people from, his, from their sins. Right? So that's a, that's a Hebrew wordplay there in Matthew. So, as you're looking for salvation, and you're waiting for righteousness, now, now you're saying, well, yeah, well, Jesus came. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm looking for him again, aren't you? Yeah, I'm looking for him again. And am I waiting for his righteousness? Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. I mean, I don't measure up, and none of us do, but it's, be it's going to be better than what's going on right now. I mean, you look across the world, and Muslims are killing Christians, and, uh, and they're, actually, they're killing anyone who doesn't believe in their exact same ideology that, that they uh, have right now. And then you can see governments are oppressing their people, and it's happening more and more with our own government, and it's happening with governments all over the world. It's happening in Russia. It's happening in China. Because, why? Jesus told us who lords over the people. He says, I don't want you to lord over people like the, the other nations do, for they lord over them. But if you want to be good in my kingdom, you will be the servant of all. So if you're the servant, you rise to the top of God's kingdom. The first shall be last, the last shall be first. But we are, and how many, I mean, this seems to be a prophecy that if you're looking for salvation and you're waiting for righteousness, you could wear out your eyes doing such a thing, right? And, uh, I know that's, that's, that's positive, right? No, it's not quite positive in the sense that, um, and, and that's how it is. But you know when you go to the movie, you know, and, and it's always up to the last second. I mean, the bomb never stops at five minutes. Woo, we had plenty of time, right? No, it always goes down to one second, right? And you're like gripping, you're doing, I mean, God's the same way. It's going to get bad. It's going to get real bad. And you're going to be white knuckling and you're going, oh, when are you coming, right? It's just building suspense. He's going to come and boom, it's going to happen all at once, right? And so uh, since you know that's going to happen, that's how God built us. That's how God works. That's how he acts. When, uh, when I was on the mission field and we needed God's provision, he didn't send it to us six months ahead of time. He didn't send us three months ahead of time. He didn't send us a week ahead of time or a day ahead of time. It was hours ahead of time, sometimes right at the time, right? And what's he doing? He says, believe into me up until the point. It's a faith-building exercise. And so when you trusting in God and you're believing in him your eyes might be worn out waiting for him and you want the word of his righteousness why because it's such a it's such a burning desire in your heart that you want to see it and you go why haven't you come yet why haven't you done this yet why because his purposes aren't complete yet and when the time is right he will act right and it'll be the most wonderful release that you that you've experienced in your life when you see oh it's here. I mean, you will be glad to see the Lord come when he comes at that point. So, but the idea that he, behind this is I've looked so hard, I don't know anymore. What does this have to do with, with the Messiah coming? Well, the idea is, is that uh, you look and you look and you look and when you're worn out and when you think all hope is lost and, th and then he appears, right? That's, that's when he shows up. And I tell you what, there is nothing more... Uh, more of a faith builder when you think you're going to plummet into the earth and you're going to be you're just going to be a smudge on the earth and all of a sudden God at the last second phew, comes through and saves it it's, it's the most amazing thing. And so uh, this is the idea about uh, waiting for God's salvation and the word of his righteousness and, uh, and uh, the psalmist and how he feels very passionate and emotional about that issue. So this next line, deal with your servant servant according to your loving kindness and teach me your statutes and so this is how God deals with his servants um, how does God deal with his servants now this word loving kindness I haven't really found a really good uh, English concept for the word behind loving kindness it's actually uh, the word in Hebrew is uh, chesed chesed is sometimes translated love Sometimes it's translated mercy. Sometimes it's translated loving kindness. But it is the idea, and the only way I kind of explain it is if you've ever been really loyal to somebody, so loyal that you will stand by them no matter what, through thick and thin. I mean, there is nothing that's going to move you from this person's side. It's, an, it's honor, it's loyalty, and it is looking out for 
who they are and what they're doing and what they're about. That is chesed. It could be described as loving kindness. It could be described as mercy. But it's, it's, it's an honor-bound tie that is unbreakable. That's what the, the chesed of God is. And so that's what God has for you. Because we're all his children. He is honor-bound. He is loyal to a fault. He is the faithful one to you and I. He is going to act in our best interest every single time. All the time, right? So, it says, deal with your servant according to your chesed. Your honor, your faithful love, your I don't know. Maybe you can feel this. It's the, you know, the, the honor, right? I mean, I can't explain it. It's unexplainable in English. It's there in Hebrew, though. And, uh, so if you were to chesed somebody, there is nothing that could separate you two. There is nothing that you wouldn't do for the person for their benefit, and everything that you did would be for their benefit. Now that's a little bit different than some of our concept of love right now. Our concept of love is making sure that people feel okay. Chesed does not mean that you feel okay all the time. Sometimes we call it tough love. Chesed always does what is faithful to the person, whether they know it or not at the time. So even God's judgment, even God's discipline can be loving, his chesed, right? Because he's loyal to you to walk in his ways. He's not loyal to let you do whatever you want to do. He's loyal to do what's going to be best for you. And what's best for you? Well, Father knows best, right? Father knows best. And so whatever he has lined up, because why? He created the universe. He created the house we live in. He created the rules of reality that we all live by. So isn't it obvious that he would know what we need to do? Absolutely. And so his faithful love, right, when you say deal with me or deal with your servant according to your loving kindness does not mean you're always going to get the warm fuzzies all the time. Right? It means that you'll get the warm fuzzies when you need the warm fuzzies. You'll get the tap on the rear end when you need the tap on the rear end. And you'll get God's discipline when you need God's discipline. And because why? Because he's training you up as a person who's going to follow after him. You see? So, deal with your servant according to your love and kindness and teach me your statutes. Now, guess what? If... Um, if you're not up for God dealing with you in this kind of way, you're not up to learning his statutes, right? And so, um, but that's why he gives us his statutes so that we will be able to, to learn from him. And so, the first part of the verse denotes that you have to have that in order to do the second part of the verse. Are you open to God's statutes? Are you open to his way of thinking if you don't think that he's on your side? Absolutely not, right? Well, I don't want to follow God. You know, he's going to make me do a bunch of stuff I don't want to do. Well, he's going to make you do some stuff you don't want to do, but he's going to make you do other things that you need to do, and he's going to do other things that you want to do, right? And as you align your heart up with his, with his word, everything that you do, everything that he says you want to do, right? And so that's why he gives us his statutes, to show us how to live, how to prosper in the reality that he made this universe our home. Ah, we're doing pretty good. So I am your servant. Give me discernment that I might know your testimonies. Does God give a discernment to those who are not his servants? I don't think so. And sometimes you'll have wisdom or you'll have um, give me wisdom, give me understanding, right? Does God give discernment to those who are not his servants? No, because his servants... Those who are not his servants don't care what God thinks. He don't, they don't look for the deeper understanding. When Jesus was standing there and says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll have no part of me. Well, the people who are saying, well, I'm your servant. I'm going to do what you want. They looked at him and go, Psh, we don't do that. We're, eating blood is, is against God's commandments. And they walked away. They were very troubled by that. But what was he saying? He wasn't saying that he was going to actually... Uh, divvy himself out to eat or that people are going to actually drink his blood. But he said that because he wanted the, the ones who were discerning, the ones who wanted the understanding, go, okay, what did you mean by that? Because we know, we understand that you're faithful to God's word and you're not going to tell people to drink blood. But on the other hand, this is confusing to us. So there's, there's something going on here. What is it? Right? The people who just rejected that out of hand, psh, Forget, we're not listening to this guy, but the people that actually knew his character and his person wanted to continue on. And it's the same thing here. I am your servant, so give me discernment. I'm going to stay. When you say the hard and difficult things that I don't quite understand, I know you're good from the outset, so therefore, 
something's, something's wrong with my understanding of it and what you're saying. So I need to change what I'm thinking because we're obviously not communicating here, right? And so what is it? What is the purpose of the commandment? What is the purpose that you have for this? What is going on, right? And so those people who are not his servants don't care about any of that. And so, so why does he give his ser uh, servants the sermon? Well, number one is because they're available to hear it. They will want to hear it. They want to know what is right versus what is wrong. And they're going to be real picky about it. You know, you'll, you'll see... Uh, as people try and follow the Lord, they're, they're being real picky about what they do and what they don't do. Not because they don't like other people, and not because they want to be legalistic, because they're trying to please God up in heaven, right? And, and it's a whole big, complex thing to walk in God's commandments on one hand. On the other hand, it's very simple. You just, you just lay your life over, and you do what God says, and you can, you can read it. But, but the balancing act is the hard thing, right? You have to balance judgment and mercy. You have to balance uh, love with discipline. You have to balance uh, uh, caring for people versus being uh, separated from them as far as your lifestyle and things like that. So there's a, there's a balance that, that has a lot of nuance to it. So so why does he give his servants discernment? So that they can discern the way to walk versus the way not to walk. And so also, according to the second part of the verse, that I might know your testimonies, and that means kind of witnessings. So I will, I will be able to see when you do something. So how do you know if God's moving how do you know if he's doing something? You have to have discernment. Uh, and the idea that in some congregations that have not been as discerning, I've seen some very disturbing things. I've actually seen demonic activity here on U.S. soil in some churches because they have not been discerning in the spirits that they allow into their congregation. Uh, uh, I don't know. You might not have seen any of this, but there was a guy... And he was called, uh, I think his name was David Crowder, not the singer, but a, a different guy. Um, and he had this whole thing about token the ghost. And they would pretend that the Holy Ghost was like marijuana, and they would toke him, and then they would just start giggling. I'm telling you, man, that is an evil spirit. I mean, that, that is not discernment, right? And so the, it's... It's really easy, and some of you might remember there's this thing called the Toronto Blessing, right? When people would be in church and they would just be barking like dogs and laughing uncontrollably and this and that and the other thing. Well, it happened before. It was called the Second Great Awakening. And uh, the, the pastors and ministers at that time said, hey, you know what? When we get someone that has uncontrollable laughter, or starts barking like a dog, or starts acting out in these different ways, the only way to get rid of, uh, rid of it is which what? Excuse me. The only way to get rid of it is with much prayer and Bible study. Right? So what does that tell you? They weren't discerning of the Spirit. They thought, well, this is the Holy Spirit because they had some phenomenon going on there. And we saw it repeat with the Toronto Blessing and things like that. So why does God give? And, and those are extreme examples. But guess what? There's discernment on the things that you watch on TV. There's discernment in the music that you listen to. You ever hear someone... Especially when I, was a, when I was a kid, right? When I was a teenager. Ah, oh, mom, you don't know. It's just music. Right? It's just, it doesn't, the words. I don't even listen to words. I just like the beat. Right. Yeah. That is a lack of discernment, my friends. I had a lack of discernment, and I can admit it now. Um, yeah, amen. There you, go. you got an amen. All right, good. So, the idea... Right? Those things, the movies that you watch, the video games that you play, the entertainment that you do, right? How do you know that you're entertaining, you're not entertaining evil angels? If we're doing entertainment in here, which is like a worship service, right? We're hopefully entertaining God and angels, right? We're inviting them in. That entertain means to invite in. So through your entertainment, what is entering in? Are you discerning it? Right? Give, I am your servant. Give me discernment that I might know your testimony. So if you know God's discernment, you will know what he's talking about. His testimony, his, when he moves and when he acts. And you will not confuse the work of the devil with the work of God. Right? You will not confuse the work of the enemy with the working of the Holy Spirit. Now is the time for the Lord to act. They have made void your instructions. Now you can see um, right here. Let's see, this is... I know, I'm going back. Hey, you're supposed to go forwards. Okay. Um, teach me your statutes. That's the Holy Spirit. Teaching how to walk, right? 
I am your servant. Give me discernment that I might know your testimonies. Bring me in. Right? Because servants are gathered in. They know God's testimony, so they're brought in closer to him. And then, now's the time for the Lord to act, for they have made void your instruction. See the rebellion coming? They have, they have left what you've said. And so now it's time to act. At some point, God will act. How do people nullify God's instruction? That's why they have made void. I like that word, void. They voided it. They put a big red stamp, void. God's instructions, not applicable. Done. How do people nullify God's instructions? Well, Isaiah 5.20 foresaw this. Woe to them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. There's plain and simple language in God's word that says what is acceptable and what is unacceptable. When you take what is unacceptable and you say that it's acceptable and then say God's word is unacceptable, you've replaced evil for good and good for evil. Right? So they have made void your instruction. They have taken what you wrote, done the exact opposite. Right? And now, now it says you, they have broken your law. See, that's what's in, in your Bible. I said made void your instruction. Why did I say made, make void your instruction instead of broken your law? Because we feel like if we go down the street and we go past 35 miles an hour in a 35 mile an hour, we've broken the law. Right? Well, God's laws are not like that. God's instructions are instructions how to live in reality, right? When you break God's laws, you break yourself. If you break the speed limit sign, you might get, you might get tagged by a policy enforcer and he's going to write you a little ticket and you're going to stay within these societal means. That's, that's one thing, right? But you break God's instructions, your eternal soul is at stake. It's a whole different ball of wax, right? One thing, you're going to get a little fine, you're going to get a little ticket. Another thing... Right? And your whole world is turned upside down. And so what are they saying? They said that they have made void your instructions. That means that the world is descending into chaos. That means the wicked are reigning. That means that we are on the cusp of, of going down, down a hole we don't want to go to. So when you allow things in the society, right? If you allow things in society, and this is another problem that we have, Hey, that's okay if they do it, but I'm here. No, we allow these things in our society. Our society as a whole is going to pay a, uh, a penalty for it. Um, so you can, like in, in this state, oh yeah, it's fine to smoke marijuana. It's, it's perfectly legit. Totally fine. Yeah, well, you can't get a federal job or a state job or be a, po a police officer if you do that. Well, so what's that saying? There's still something wrong with it, isn't there? So what have they done? They've called evil good and good evil, right? And so... When they've done that, they've broken God's instruction because God says not to be drunk with wine. That means do not leave your senses. Do not become incensed so that uh, you open yourself up to other influences, which was what drugs do. Drugs were always made uh, so that witch, witches and stuff could go into trances. That's what drugs are. That's what the peyote is for. That's what um, the opium is for. That's what all that stuff is for, is to get you in an altered state of consciousness. And so they've said, nullified God's instructions. Why? So it doesn't matter if I smoke pot or not. If they're smoking pot, it's having a detrimental effect on the society, right? So we can't, we don't have the force of law behind us anymore, so now what do we have to do? We have to convince people to go God's ways so that they will, they will forsake that on their own because it doesn't matter what the Washington state law is. It only matters what God's instructions are because this is what we're going by. They can pass whatever law they want. This is the law that matters. This is the instruction that matters. It breaks the reality when we do this, right? And it affects the entire society. So the Lord will act when people nullify his instructions. The wicked, the wicked are going to suffer the consequences because it's not like God has to actively go out and go, hey, you've disobeyed my instructions. Therefore, you know, you can, the wrath is going to come. I have to actively now do, no. It's like falling off the roof. When you hit the ground, you're going to break something. You break one of God's laws, you fall off that, you're going to break something, right? It's a natural, because God made the nature this way, he made the universe this way, it's a natural reaction to, to ignoring God's instructions that the universe actually starts to reject what you're doing. And then eventually God comes and says, that's it, and he puts a stop to it. Because otherwise, everything would come crashing down. We'd break God's universe, and uh, there'd be nothing left. And so he has, to, he has to save us from ourselves before that goes too far. Right? So the, the Lord will act at some point to stop the reality being broken to the point where none would survive. Right? Therefore, I love your commandments more than gold, more than fine gold. So this, you might have heard this, gold is the currency of kings, 
Silver is the currency of merchants. Debt is the currency of slaves. Guess what's not up here? What's God's currency? God's commandments are the currency of his kingdom. Therefore, I love your commandments more than gold, even more than fine gold. He says, store up your treasure in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy or, and, and do not corrupt. Right? So how do you store up your treasures in heaven? By, by storing up God's treasures, which means doing his commandments. Doing the things that he says. That's how you store up your treasures in heaven because God's currency is his commandments. You want to be great in the kingdom of God? Do God's commandments. Because you can acquire all the gold, the silver, and the debt you want. Because some people are surviving on debt, right? And then they're a slave to the one who holds the debt. But hey, no matter what, no matter what kind of currency you're using in this world, it, you cannot spend it in heaven. It's, I don't care what kind of car you drive, what kind of house you have. What, it doesn't matter. Once you shuffle off this mortal coil, all that matters is God says, how did you do my instructions? Right? Now, I'm not saying that wealth is bad. Right? I am saying that you use the wealth according to God's instructions because the commandment is what the currency is. God gave you that in order for you to do, because he trusted you with it. And now what are you going to do with it? Right? Uh, so to those who he trusts more, he gives more because he, he wants them to do more with it. And those who have less are, are given less because they, if they gave them more, because God's a loving father, if he gave them more, they wouldn't know what to do with it. You know, a lot of money will kill somebody. So, so be blessed. If you have a little or you, if you have a lot, God has given that to you for you to be faithful with what you have. Because the currency is not the issue. It's your heart and what you do with it for his kingdom and what you do with it in order to fulfill his commandments. That is the issue. So God's commandments are the currency of his kingdom. And it's more precious. And that's gold, right? That's gold that you've mined out of the ground. And fine gold is refined gold, right? Pure gold. Last one, therefore all your commandments, all your ways are straight. I hate every false way. So we talked about the kingdom, right? All, what's the currency of God's kingdom? That's the, that's the line talking about the kingdom. Now this is talking about uh, eternity. So in eternity, is there going to be any sin? Are there going to be any false ways? No. Um, so all your commandments, all your ways are straight. <clears throat> That's that word there, Yashar. Sometimes you'll have, um, you'll have different, what does it say here in the ESV? All your, all your precepts to be right. Well, the word for, this word right here, Yashar, is the word for straight, straight ahead in Hebrew. And if it's the straight path, it's God's way, right? So all your ways lead straight to where you want them to go. And so the idea is that God has not given a bad commandment. I don't care if, if it's the kookiest thing you read back here uh, in the Old Testament. It's not a bad commandment. God didn't go, oh man, I wrote that. Well, later on, we're not going to worry about that, right? He didn't say that. He, everything he wrote in here is for our instruction, right? So there's a way that it applies. You know, um, one of the ones is build, build a fence around your house on the roof. Well... I'm not building a fence around my roof. Why? Because no one's going up there. But in their time, they had flat roofs. If someone went up the roof and they fell down off the roof, you'd be responsible for it, wouldn't you? So if someone comes onto my property and they get injured because of my neglect of a uh, safety issue, guess whose fault it is? It's the same concept, right? So those things are throughout Scripture. Those commandments, those laws, uh, there's, there's an implication that goes underneath all those things that is for our benefit and for our living. So every single commandment is good. And God is going to teach us the nuances of all those things for eternity when we go to be with Him forever. Right? So the idea that every way of God uh, that is not of God's is a false way. So the idea is, is do we hate every false way. Are we searching the scriptures? Or are we saying like lots of people say, oh God doesn't care about that, God doesn't care about that um, you know, I can do this, I can do that. Why are we so concerned about what we can do? We should be more concerned about what God wants us to do. Why do we want to push the envelope? Well, I can go over here, you know, I've got grace. Look we all live by grace, but by grace doesn't mean that I have to walk on this edge of the cliff, does it? I got grace. I got grace. I'm gonna. Why don't we just walk over here? 
Right? If God's commandment, you know, let's just walk over here. It's a safer thing. It's dumb to walk on the edge of the cliff. Right? So, that's, and this is a personal thing. This is, so this goes back to that whole thing about the media, about the entertainment, about what you do, what you read, what you say, what you, all of that stuff. Do you hate every false way? Because in God's kingdom, right, and which was what we're preparing for, there are no false ways. A lot of the things that we do right now are not even going to be done in God's kingdom. Right? Uh, I don't think there'll be TV. I'm pretty sure there won't be iPads or smartphones. Amen. You know, I mean, we're not going to need them, right? Those things are like crutches. I mean, when we're in, in the glorified body and, and have everything, I mean, we will be supernatural at that point. It'll be absolutely amazing. I mean, the stuff that we'll be able to retain in our minds, it's going to be fantastic. But uh, all these things that we have are a poor shadow of a... a so it's just a poor shadow of a reflection of what we will have just within ourselves because God created perfect people, right? We're imperfect now, but when perfection comes, we will have a perfect body. We'll have a perfect mind. We'll have perfect f facilities. And we will not do anything false. We will not go in any false way whatsoever. And so the idea is, you know, now's a good time to practice, right? Right? Now's a good time to practice, to walk in God's ways. And guess what? The farther in, the deeper in you go to walking in God's ways, the weirder you look to everyone else. So get used to it. You're going to start to become separate. You're going to start to look odd. Now, I know when I was in high school, I did not want to be separate and look odd. Right? I didn't want to stand out. I wanted to be, you know, like I wanted to wear... At that time, it was like code blue jeans and stuff like that. I wanted to have some code blue jeans because everybody else had some code blue so I want to have them, right? Uh, people had a nice car. I want a nice car. You know, I, I didn't want to, I didn't, but you know what? Walking God's ways makes me peculiar. It makes other people look at me and go, what's he doing? You know, but the thing is, you've got to have it within yourself that you're strong enough in yourself that you're going to follow God's ways no matter what. You're going to take every false way within you and you're going to put that under the, under the cross and you're going, to, you're going to walk with Jesus how he shows you how to walk. And it's not always the prettiest road, but it leads to the best type of glory in the end, right? You think that Jesus went down and he went down to the cross and go, oh yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to walk this road up the hill and put the cross up there and I, I mean that was the most humiliating that was the most set apart thing that was the worst thing that could have happened to the son of God to be sacrificed and have his blood shed out of his body in that way right but what did it do it put him up at the right hand of the father so the road the right way is not necessarily the pretty way it's not the way that the world goes but it's the way that leads to the kingdom of God up in heaven. And that's really where we want to travel, right? So, have we put away every false way? I'm not going to do the summary here because this is getting a little bit long. But, um, but you, I'll put it up here so you can kind of see. They kind of, I've been kind of doing it as I've gone along with the chapter. Uh, judgment save us from oppression. That's first and foremost God's righteous judgments. Our surety saves us from oppressors or it saves us from our sin as well. Uh, God appears with salvation. He teaches us his ways. We draw closer to him. He acts against the wicked. God's commandments are the riches of his kingdom and God's ways are perfect. So I'm sorry if you're going to try and write that all down. We'll try and get that to you a little bit later because I'm going to switch it. Okay? Okay. Okay. So let's go to the love, learn, live. Because God, love God because he gives us insight. He enables us to see what's in his word. That's what the ayin is about. Wisdom and understanding and knowing how to follow after God. And we need to learn to discern the things of God. You need to t think, okay, I've got to take stock in my life now. I've got to see, is there any way in me? Is there anything that I think? Is there anything that I do that is not God's ways? Because I need to, I need to get rid of that. Right? I need to discern. And if you have trouble, it's real easy. You just, for one thing, you have to be in this book every day. I was listening to, I think it was Charles Swindoll. He goes, what, what brought him to the, to the area that he was at? He had to do a sermon every week. I can identify with that. I've got to do a sermon every week, which means what? I've got to be in this thing. I mean, I've got to be in it. 
But since I'm in it so much, it transforms the way I think and the way I live. If you want to see that same thing, like Charles Stanley, like, like a pastor who's in the Word every week, where, if you want to see the same, you've got to do it too. You've got to have it. You've got to have it in you. Then you can discern the things of God and the things that you don't know. You go, Father, is there anything in me? Is there anything in me that you don't like, approve of, or want in my life? Show it to me. And guess what he does? He will hit you like a bolt between the eyes. Boom! You go, oh, that's it. But he doesn't show you things you don't ask for. Why? Because he figures you don't care. Why is he going to... He, he doesn't... He, a bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not put out. That's a, that's a prophecy about the Messiah. But it also has with God. That means that he does not give you information you didn't ask for. Why? Because you're not open to the answer. You want to discern the ways of God? You have to be open to the answer. And then you have to put it into practice. So you need to learn how to do that. And then to live to remove every false way. Once you're able to discern between right and wrong, and God's helping you with that, then you can get away every false way out of your life. What is the benefit? What is the payoff? The payoff, the benefit is God's kingdom, right? People will start looking at you and they go, man, he's strange, but man, he loves people. Man, she's... She doesn't do everything else that the world does, but I want to be around. She doesn't matter what happens to her. It doesn't matter what happens to him. They're okay with it. How is that, how is that possible? Missionaries in China, they would have a house. There's so much demonic activity in that country that people would walk into the missionary's house and they get saved just because it felt different. It was a peace in the house. Why? Because they'd kicked out all those other false ways and influences. They didn't do the same things as other people did, right? You do the same thing, there will be something different about you. You will have the aroma of the kingdom about you. And some people will reject it, but some people will want to know why. And even your enemies, when they see that you don't react the way the world does, they're going to go, why? Why? And that's going to be the driving thing in their mind. That's the kingdom of God. And the payoff is when God says to you, He says, Good and well done, my faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord, and He will have such a spread laid out for you, you won't be able to believe it. Because no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him and walk according to His ways. So, with that being said, I do need to wrap it up. I do get a little carried away, so if, forgive me if I've, if I've gone past your attention span, but let's pray and uh, wrap up the service here. Father, I just appreciate your word. And everyone here, I pray that you would bless them in their homes. I would pray that you would bless them in their families. And that you would give them the discernment to show which way to walk. To find the good path, the ancient way, and walk in it. Because that's the way that leads to your kingdom. If there's anyone here harboring anything, if they lack discernment, let them ask of God who grants wisdom. Right, right out of James, that he will grant the wisdom to discern between right and wrong and to ask which way to walk in and that you would show them and that they would take it upon themselves to take every false way within them and put it under your commandments and your way. And Father, we, will, we appreciate you in doing that for us. And as this song goes, if there's anything that you want to lay before the throne of God today, if there's something that God in His Holy Spirit is saying, you need to get rid of this, you need to get rid of that, you've discerned some evil in your life already, then I pray that you put that under the blood of Jesus today uh, at, at the close of the song. Or if there's a false way within any one of us, Father, bring that to our attention so that we can correct that and walk in your word and walk in your way. And we'll give you all the praise and the honor and the glory for that. Because you're our Father and you sent your Son, Jesus the Messiah, on our behalf. And in his name we pray. Amen.